I'm here to talk about how Parliament is supposed to work. This is actually a fairly brief subject, so I won't have to speak long, which is good because I've never actually sat in Parliament or in, or in the legislature, but I've certainly watched it being done for a long time and I've read about it. And actually I discovered some things fairly recently in life that about our parliamentary system I didn't actually know. All truly democratic systems seek, of course, to ensure that government remains accountable to the people uh, who are being governed. Um, accountable for the laws it proposes to enact, and accountable for how it executes programs, departments, crown agencies, etc., uh, that are established by laws that have already been passed. That's what parliaments do. It is to hold governments accountable to the people. Now our system, the Westminster system that we adapted from Britain, I mean there are ways of doing this, but ours is particular, it's a fairly common one in the world. It's called the Westminster system, it originated and developed in Britain and has been adapted to other countries around the world. Uh, and our system does this holding government accountable uh, by, means, uh, by a means called responsible government which it, the Canadian originators in the middle of the 1800s uh, figured out. It's not exactly the same as the British system, but it's very similar. Now if you already know all this, and I hope you'll forgive me, but I've discovered that most people don't actually know how it's supposed to work, even the ones who think they do. Um, the, uh, uh, here it is, and it's pretty basic. The thing I would, I mean, I could talk about all kinds of aspects, but the one that I think all of us have to focus on the most is what's the mainspring of the Westminster system? What's the key point? What's the, what's the, what's the secret to it? The key person in responsible government is not the Prime Minister. That's, that's not the key person at all. In responsible government, the key person is the member of parliament, the individual MP elected to represent the legitimate rights and interests of all the people in a specific area of the country. I want to repeat that because it's so important. The key person in the Westminster system is the member of parliament. Except for those MPs in the House who are invited uh, to take part in cabinet, to serve in cabinet, except for them, I want to say cabinet, that is government. Except for them, the task of the MP is to hold the government accountable. And if necessary, to defeat the government in order to hold it accountable to the needs, interests, and wishes of the population. This is no less true of the MPs on the majority side of the House as it is on the, for those on the minority side. They may do it differently on the majority side, but it is their job as MPs to do it nonetheless. Now note the terminology here, majority side, minority side. It's very important. We, we can, we, we're allowed to refer to them as the government side and the opposition side, and normally we do. Both terms are legitimate. But the first way, the majority-minority dichotomy, is a better description for understanding this point because it does not conflate a majority member of the House with the government. The government is the cabinet and that's it. Plus the bureaucracy, plus the queen, that's the government. The rest of the House is not part of government including the majority MPs. <coughs> the government is the cabinet and yes, its members are chosen from within the House, that's true. And yes, it sits inside the House, not like the American system. But that is so that it, it, the government, can properly account to the representatives of the people sitting in the House. That's why we do it that way. And this is the key. It's the mainspring of the Westminster system. And it always was. But note this, it only works if the government, if, sorry, if, it only works if the members on the majority side of the House see themselves not as government, 
and not as the government's infantry, sworn to unquestioning obedience on every issue. It works only if the majority MPs in the House see themselves as overseers of the government, and not necessarily supporters of them, as scrutineers of what the government's doing, as representatives whose task it is to hold the government accountable. How often have you heard people say, or perhaps said to yourself, that the best governments are minority governments? And why do people say this? Because they've noticed that minority governments, unlike majorities, cannot behave dictatorially. dictatorially. But we also notice that minority governments tend to be without direction, generally get fairly little done, spend ridiculous amounts of money, and last only two years. So I don't think minority governments, even though they sometimes happen, are necessarily a very adequate answer. The ideal answer of the Westminster system is a majority government properly held to account by its own members, along, along with, the co uh, with the cooperation of the minority members. That is responsible government in the Westminster system. And interestingly enough, that is the kind of government I think it's safe to say, as a general observation, that Canada actually had in the 1800s. But if you look back, you see it began to change in the 20th century into something quite different, to the point that by the 1950s or 60s, it's almost unrecognizable. You see, parties and party lead, you see, we've seen around that time, maybe as far back as the 40s, Parties and party leaders attain powers over MPs that they were never meant to have. And you see voters completely lose sight of how the system is supposed to work, with the result that government grows less and less accountable. It would be wrong to see this as some kind of evil plot by some sinister individual. Um, it came about by degrees. This frog slowly got boiled and boiled and boiled. Little by little, it, it was driven by the, really, I think, by the changing dynamics of Canadian society. Mostly, the problem has to do with scale. The scale of the population and the scale of government activities. You know, we had bigger ridings. It used to be 4,000 people or so in a Canadian federal riding way back in the 1800s. The guy that got elected probably knew half of them, or a whole bunch. He certainly knew the ones in the communities that mattered. Um, but now what do we got? 100, 120,000 voters in the riding? Uh, bigger, and there are bigger public expectations of government. In the original days of Confederation, Ottawa ran the post office and had something to do with the militia. And not too much else. Oh yeah, and it collected taxes, but it didn't collect very many. Um, government in 1900 in Canada was in total, not just federal, but all levels, so it's less than 10% of the economy was government. Today it's 40, 44% in that range, in a much, much bigger economy. So you can see how, how vast the operation has become. We also have today mass media. You know, people in the old days used to know what they thought locally and make sure their MP would do it. And so he'd go down to Ottawa and he'd tell them which way he was voting on this because that's what he was told to do and he agreed with it. Today, everything's messaging, mass media, party positions, etc. So it changes the game considerably. Uh, we've seen the emergence of national clientels or communities on a scale that, would, that just didn't exist in the 1800s. Labor, business, women's interests, environmental interests, contending social philosophies. These are national identities that, with which MPs must contend and they aren't unique to any one area, they're all over the place. Remember, the MP of long ago had two duties. Oversight of legislation and oversight of government execution. That was what he did. But now there are two more, at least, two more major ones, which all too often crowd out the first two. Uh, the MP, as, as any MP here can tell you, is the constituency ombudsman. His people are dealing with a massive federal bureaucracy 
they need help. He has to give them that help. That's one of his big consumer of his time. And he does have to do it, or he doesn't get reelected. Uh, the other new role is party communications. He's now a, a sort of a communications agent of the party, and he gets his talking points, and he's supposed to use them because the party has to send one message across the country. Now these together have become, these, last, these latter two responsibilities are now so important that they have come to dominate the attention of MPs, uh, so much so that their original role and purpose, that of monitoring the government, especially on the majority side of the House, has pretty much been crowded out. Now there's no easy answer to this, and it's not my job to give you one. Maybe Brent, who's going to speak next, will start with some answers. But there's no easy fix to this, and there's no perfect fix. Uh, I think that, you know, there are people I've heard say, well, let's just get rid of Parliament entirely, just elect the government directly. You know, we'll elect a cabinet, that's it. Uh, some would say we've already reached that point, in fact. Uh, so why not just admit it and save the money? I don't agree at all, but frankly, it's kind of a hard case to, to refute. Others would say we should try to adapt our system or adopt in some way the congressional system we see in the United States, because that, they say, works better. Again, I would disagree. I don't think it does. They all have the same, they have all the same problems we do, and on ten times the scale. My own instinct, personally, is that we should rediscover and adapt the system we were given. I don't know exactly how to do it, but the essentials of it are pretty good. If the MP can be a, f a free agent, yes, a member of a party, and the party got him elected, we all understand that part, and that, you can't forget it. But in the end, he's got to be a free agent, especially where confidence in the government is not involved. And maybe Brent can talk about that, or we can discuss it in question period. But our habit in Canada, and I think throughout the Westminster system around the world, more and more and more is to treat every issue that goes before the House as a matter of confidence in the government. This is so wrong, because it removes the, if the MP on the majority side votes against it, he, he sends his, you know, if enough of them do that, they go back to an election, and that is not always a good thing. But if the budget fails or the throne speech fails, I think there's one or two others, that always have to be matters of confidence. And yes, you may have to defeat a government over that, but hopefully sensible people, sensible minds will prevail and you'll avoid it. But I think that the system we've got is probably to some degree fairly fixable and we should look very seriously at how to do it rather than chase some totally new thing, uh, which will never happen anyway. So I think our job as Canadians uh, is to fix the system we've been given. Uh, and Whatever we do, I think, has to start by understanding the way it's supposed to work. Thank you.